Now, this is a really good site to see, a nice big field room. So thank you all for coming in and participating in our face-to-face uh, -face version of our skills workshop today, focus on retention recruitment strategies. B again, thank you all for coming. I feel like this is the best way for all of us to engage in our networking regarding into our leisure industry, as you can see how um, vast and um, large it is. So we have our online um, sessions previously, but it's so hard to network with one another. So again, please feel free. Um, this is the whole point, as much as us, for us to skill ourselves and upskill ourselves accordingly. Um, it's a matter of networking with each other and helping ourselves out to improve the leisure um, industry overall. Um, so my name is Christopher Rivera. I have been a, um, an assessor previously. You probably recognize my face as I come in um, to assess um, some of the various centers. Recently been appointed as the lead coordinator of projects for Lifesaving Victoria. So I'm hoping to work with um, a lot of you in the future for uh, future projects. So I'll begin by starting um, and welcome you all to our workshop today. Um, it is being held on the lands of the Bunyurong people of the South Eastern Kulin Nation. And I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the lands and the waterways in which we swim, play, explore and work. We also like to pay respect to their elders, past, present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. So before we officially begin, I'd like to also um, say that we begin being mindful of the positive, safe and supportive work environment we seek to build across LSV and life saving. Encourage everyone to be part of an open and respectful exchange of ideas and value what is shared. So we're going to come across is get into our workshop today. Um, we have Alec, who is our current um, aquatic industry services manager. Um, he'll come across and highlight our current state of play. Um, all our other presenters as well I'll introduce um, as we come along. Um, but they'll all basically come through with our first session. We focus on what we currently know, uh, where we have our issues and currently question um, where we are as an industry today with our second half of the workshop to look at strategies and kind of get us thinking of where we can evolve as, um, as an industry. Um, so, Alec, um, if you'd like to come up um, and present where, where we are today. Thank you, Chris. Um, Chris has been, I don't know, in the role now for about three weeks. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, first task for Chris when he started at, um, uh, in, in this team was to, to set up this project um, and to set up um, today. So, just a round of applause for Chris for getting this together. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. My name is Alec Olszewski. I'm the uh, Aquatic Industry Services Manager here at Lifesaving Victoria. And I have the pleasant um, duty of, of kick, kicking us off today. I, I hope that you also have a, a pleasant and hospitable time with us here today. But as I said, I've been asked to kick things off. And, and my, my presentation today isn't, um, isn't going to be in presenting you any facts um, in fact, um, I'm, I'm, I'm here to, to start to ask us to think um, and start to question um, where we are as an industry and where we want to be in the future. So things like what's working, what's not working, um, what do we need to collectively fix uh, and what actions will be required in the future. I'm also here today to learn alongside of you. I'm by no means a re uh, retention or recruitment expert, which is why we um, we tried to line up a set of speakers today that are. And um, as Chris said, um, so that we might go uh, away um, having learned a little and we can all collectively improve um, what we do just a little bit more. Um, it's an interesting day um, today. Does anyone um, follow the census? Yeah, the census data, the latest census data is being, um, being revealed today. Um, and some fun facts um, from this morning compared to five years ago. Um, there are 2 million new Australians amongst us, according to the latest census. Christianity um, no longer exceeds 50% of our, our total population. So that's dropped below um, the 50% mark for the f first time to about 48%. Um, um, and 40% of people who answered the question um, said they have no religion at all. So just a, a bit of a, a change there. A fifth of the population is now millennials and they've overtaken the baby, boomer, baby boomers who were previously the, the highest ranked um, populations um, 
in, in Australia. More than half Australians um, have a parent born overseas or were born overseas themselves. So we, we're now tipping over 50% um, of, of that multicultural and, and called community. Um, and the most common country of birth, other than Australia, um, is now India, which has leapfrogged um, New Zealand and China in the last five years. So some interesting um, changes coming um, from that. Um, the census, of course, um, will be um, released um, throughout the rest of the year. Um, and the, the key one that we will all be looking for um, because of this forum is the employment data and, the, um, and where employment's going. Um, and that's set in the census October release. So, um, yeah, that was just a bit of an aside that I added in this morning listening to the radio on the way in this morning. I've worked in the aquatic industry for quite some time. I've managed um, seasonal pools. Um, I've been a lifeguard. I've been a duty manager. I once taught a swimming lesson, once, one lesson, um, but I, I got enough out of that experience to know I didn't want to do it. Um, I was, um, before this role, I was the inaugural um, operations manager at Aquapulse, which is a facility just, just along the, um, the coast here towards Werribee. So, $9 billion. $9 billion is um, the... Uh, the value that's been placed on our aquatic industry. This report, um, the social health and economic value of the, um, the Australian national aquatic industry was, was released uh, last year um, by PricewaterhouseCoopers um, and was commissioned by Royal Life Saving Society of Australia. And have we got RJ in the room? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, if you, if you do want to hit up anybody about this, this report, um, please... Um, hit him up um, and ask him how he came up with the value. But this is what we're here um, protecting, if you like. This is our value. Um, and I was recently um, at a couple of other forums and a lot of um, aquatic industry forums um, currently talk about social impact, um, social value, health value. Um, and this is the figure collectively that PricewaterhouseCoopers put on, on that value to the community. So it is quite a big industry. You have quite a large impact um, and there's, um, there's a lot more to it than just drowning prevention or, uh, or, or teaching swimming lessons. So uh, a couple of um, points that I pulled out of there to help us start to think. This first one, beyond preventing drowning deaths, the aquatic industry has been shown to boost health by reducing the burden of disease, improving mental health outcomes and reducing absenteeism. And another. The social benefit is where the aquatic industry has traditionally been under-recognised, bringing people together, supporting marginalised groups and supporting early learning are some of the critical ways um, the public pools support their local communities. According to that report, the sector em employs more than 67,000 employees. One of the figures that we often throw around um, in Victoria is that we've got 40,000 employees. Um, in, in the sector. So um, if, if we're over two thirds of that, I think we've, we've got a little bit um, um, to make up there. But according to this report, 67,000 employees and the industry provided the social return on, uh, on investment um, for every dollar spent in operating our facilities, there's $4.87 um, return to the community in value. So that's quite a big piece that we're um, responsible for taking forward um, and that our workers um, produce in value to, to Australians every day. Um, and that figure in, um, in regional Victoria, $2.18, obviously it's more expensive to run our facilities in, I'm um, sorry, in regional Australia. Right, so we're going to kick off and I hope this works. Um, Trudy, we're going to um, Slido. Jump onto slido.com and our... Um, our code here is um, 2297816. Question is going to be this. What are the biggest challenges being faced by the industry right now? So we've got staff shortages coming through. All right. Staff shortages. Any, any others? Staffing, lack of qualified staff. Lack of qualified staff. Recruitment. Recruitment. Um, what else have we got? Inflation. Inflation. And that was one I was definitely going to throw to you later. 
Retention and keeping staff. Okay. Uh, illnesses. Illnesses. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. And overworking. Overworking. Training, again, turnover. Um, one that's always plagued the industry, short shifts uh -huh. post-COVID. And the volume of um, swimming lessons that are being yeah, people are enrolling into. And then also staff travel. Um, obviously, we've now got the opportunity to travel. That's another one that's coming up as well. Yeah. But definitely staff shortages, recruitment and illness are the top ones there. So, right. thank you. So, staff shortages, recruitment and illness. Does anyone have um, a burning desire to talk about their experience in centre at the moment with, with staff recruitment, for example? If you don't, that's okay. Jamie, I'm going to throw to you. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I know your face. Um, and you used to work for me, so straight to you. Um, Jamie, you're at um, East Keeler Leisure Centre. It's a relatively new facility. It's a relatively new facility. Was And you and I worked together when we opened Aquapulse um, and we had hundreds of people literally um, coming through the door. What's been the experience um, for recruitment for a new facility? The, the issues that we had when we first opened, um, we did have a, quite a bit of a staff shortages at the initial stage. Mm -hmm. um, but majority of our staff now um, are brand new. Yeah. So I think the, the training is, is, was a big part of it um, yeah. and induction process. We, we were able to, we didn't, we kind of just kept the uh, recruitment process going on, like ongoing through summer and after summer. So we haven't really had the biggest issue at the moment for, for rostering and whatnot. Yeah. But probably 95% of our staff team are brand new, never worked in the industry before. They're probably between the ages of 16 and 20. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's probably our biggest biggest challenge right now is obviously having brand new, uh, well, people to the industry, uh, not having any um, knowledge in, on pool safety really. Yeah. And then trying to obviously teach people how to do that. All right. Thank you for sharing, Jamie. Thanks for calling me out. Alex. Yeah, it's all right. I'm going <laughs> to call, call out another previous colleague of mine, Pia. Pia, you're in the front row down here. Um, Pia. Um, Pia and I used to work together at Aquapulse, and Pia is in um, HR as the HR manager at, at Western Leisure Services at the moment. Pia. It's the coordinator. Oh, okay. Coordinator. <laughs> um, what's been the experience at Western Leisure Services? Have you, have you lost stuff? Are you yeah, gaining? No yeah. doubt that um, it's been unrelenting in terms of turnover and then replacing. So um, obviously everything from swim teachers to lifeguards but also in the corporate space mm -hmm. um, where it's hard to compete as well, um, you know, with, you know, things like risk and safety managers, uh -huh. um, you know, those uh, high-level positions as well. Yeah. So it's been unrelenting and exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's... a uh, you know, and then that's resulted in um, a knowledge loss. Uh -huh. And we feel that we've got some great new leaders um, in the business, so which is there is um, pos there is positives and we can see um, things slowly turning around. Um, but the team will tell you, yeah, it's un been unrelenting. Right. Thank you for sharing. I think no doubt some experiences um, that we're all going through. The next slide I'm going to talk to... Um, is uh, the NAB Behavioural Insights Report um, from February um, 2021, um, which, but essentially it, it's, a, it's a report from February 2021, um, which talked about the Great Resignation um, and sort of forecast that we were heading into a space where um, record job numbers, um, uh, sorry, record um, people would leave their jobs um, as a result of, of the economy reopening um, and the demand for labour increasing. Um, and it was particularly noted in, in, in many countries such as the United States. Um, and the question was, what here for Australia? Um, at the time, um, the opinions varied, um, um, with some predicting millions of burnt out workers would leave their job and their current employment, um, while others um, dismissed the phenomenon with no evidence. So, um, at that point in time, over one in five Australians um, had changed their job in the past year. 
Um, one in four were considering it, and with many planning to move to a new role, uh, a new role in an industry, or take a career break. So, my question to you now is: What has been the experience um, since that time? We, we've come almost eighteen months um, to two years since that, um, and I'd like you to think about that as we go through today. Um, but of course, we're here today to talk about these um, three key points: swim teacher shortage, lifeguard shortage and skills shortage, and I think that those were reflected in the two speakers that we had, um, and so thank you. Um, but the good news is uh, productivity is up, if you think about it, not really. So essentially we've, we've seen um, the same amount of work or more work in the industry with uh, fewer skills and fewer people to do the jobs, and so you're all feeling a little bit burnt out, right? So the question today is what can we do about this? Uh, and we're seeing it as well. We've we've seen an increase in productivity here at, at Life Saving Victoria. We've done um, close to two, 200 um, pool safety assessments, which pre-COVID, we were doing about 135. So we come back this year, the demand's there, but there's less people working. Um, and we're all just um, getting it along as best we can. So this was going to be my second slide over. The question is, what are the biggest barriers to recruitment and retention in the industry today? Okay, so we're seeing quite a few come through with qualifications, stability of employment, pay, incentives, skills shortage, cost of getting a qualification. There is a huge amount here. So unpaid training, trust within the industry, opportunities for progression, the time taken to recruit, work-life balance, seasonality, work environment, and also too much training. Right, some, some really interesting themes coming out of there. One, one that, um, that I, sorry, true. Also trust in, in progression, which is an interesting one as well. Trust in progression. Right. Um, look, some really interesting um, insights there and um, what we will do, qualifications, yes. What are we doing about qualifications? Um, the work environment, how are we making the work environment um, sustainable? How are we um, encouraging people to stay with us longer term? Qualifications, who's paying for them? Progression, how do we progress through the industry instead of um, continuing um, this theme of um, one in, one out, as people um, move from um, high school student to university student and then out the door into other industries. These are all questions that I'm hoping that we can start to answer today and I'm not gonna try and answer them um, this second. But these are the types of questions that I want you to put to the, the speakers. And what do we know and what don't we know? Um, how long have we known about a swim teacher shortage? And what have we done about it? What do we do when we recruit lifeguards? Why do we always recruit in October, November, um, and then kick them all out of the industry again in March? Um, what are the traditional models for onboarding staff? How are they working? Um, and are they continuing to work? What effect will the economy have on our facilities in the next 12 months? What effect um, will it have on the workers? What about rising gas prices, rising electricity prices? How will that affect our working staff? Um, as I said earlier, I've been to a couple of um, aquatic industry seminars lately. Here's some, um, some buzz phrases that I heard at those. Inspiring places are our places where we uh, work inspiring. Experience the greatness. I think this is on a, on a membership um, ad um, trying to sell to trying to sell to customers, but what's the uh, experience of our staff? Are they experiencing the greatness of our facilities? Lifelong customer experiences, empowered workplaces, trusted provider, pathways, these are all things that are in our job ads. Is it reality? And I'm challenging you to make sure that these things are actually in place. On Friday, I had the pleasure of, uh, of going to YMCA's Thrive 2020 event and Matt Weishite, who's the, I think, exec general manager of, um, close, of um, 
of, of recreations here with us in the room. So, Matt, I apologise if I, I speak out of turn here. But um, Brett Reed um, was there and I met Brett a couple of times. Brett Reed is the general manager of people and culture at, at the YMCA and he said this, 80% of YMCA staff work within the LGA that they live in, right? So how many of your staff are from outside of the LGA um, and are these an untapped um, resource for you? Or is the 80% of the staff that work for you from within the LGA in line with the demographic within that LGA? So do those 80% staff represent the community that they actually work in? Here's another one that was interesting that Brett said while he was on the stage. 60% of YMCA staff come to the facility they obtained their qualification in, right? So if they do the qualification in your facility, there's an opportunity there. And 60% of YMCA staff are, are looking to be employed at the facility they do their qualification in. Yeah? This is slide number three. How do we recruit people to our industry now? And I think if you want to reflect here and say we should, we should do something else in future. I'd be interested if, um, if you could answer we should do or ha and how we do now um, on that question set. So social media seems to be a, a fairly common one. Yep. Word of mouth. Um, through sports people. Uh-huh. Sports people, the most famous jobs board in the aquatic and sporting industry maybe. Offering full-time and part-time work and incentives. Um, Tapping into the swim school parents. Yeah, swim school parents is a good thing that we should be doing. Uh, messaging to members. Yep. Uh, some other things in relation to offering incentives. So... Um, sick leave, um, pathways, and also that incentives again, creating a purpose of being, paid training, looking at placement opportunities, tapping into um, swimming clubs. Thank you, and thank you all for sharing. That's really valuable data for us. We've got over 100 industry professionals in the room answering um, these questions, and that gives us a tremendous amount of insight. Um, some key ones there, social media, um, sports people, these are, these are quite traditional um, ways of, uh, of, offering, um, of offering job roles. One of the other things that Brett Reed said in, in, um, in the YMCA Thrive event that I was at on Friday, he said, QR codes are the way of the future. We should have QR code job ads, but we should be responding to job ads in such a way that I QR code it today at the centre, by the time I get home, I'm getting a phone call from your recruitment department to say, hey, we've got a job for you, are you interested? That's the type of real life, real live world um, opportunities that we should be offering people. But the other bit is, um, and it was very um, evident throughout um, that Service Victoria um, situation that we had uh, where we were QR coding everywhere, that's not accessible to everybody. So think about the flip side. How do you tap into those job markets um, where QR code, media, um, these type of things aren't accessible? Um, and again, these are questions that I want you to put to the, the rest of our panellists um, today. This is my um, final slide coming up next. Any fitness buffs in the room? Any membership salespeople? Anybody recognise this set of metrics? 100%, 15%, 40%? So when, when we're selling gym memberships, 100% 100 of people want to be fitter, have a, um, a desire to be fitter. And this was a, another thing I picked up on Friday, so I'm sorry, Matt, you've seen it before. 100% of people want to be fitter. 15% of people go and buy a membership. And of those, 40% are leaving in 12 months. Right? That's, that's real life retention stats in our membership space. My question to you is, do you know how many of your staff turn over and on what rate they do? Because we know it in memberships. We ought to know this in our staff circles as well. So I, I challenge you on, on that. So I'm about to hand over to the rest of our speakers for today. Um, they're going to be um, hopefully addressing some of our concerns that we have with our swim teacher shortage, our lifeguard shortage and our skills shortage. 
Um, and I just, again, want to thank you for joining us here at Lifesaving Victoria for our second workshop of the year. Thank you very much. Um, so our next person we've got is um, Michael uh, Butson. He's a researcher um, based at various universities and he's actually um, produced some really interesting research papers based on the leisure industry um, regarding lifeguard turnover managers' um, view of the turnover. His recent research goes into the swim teacher shortage and the industry there. So he speaks in the way his research is among the, the view of employees and the view of managers and leaders as well. Um, so I'd like to welcome him across to bring um, his research and information across, which I feel is rather interesting. Um, I enjoyed reading, reading through what he produced. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, guys. Um, firstly, thank you, LSV, for jumping on board my research, having a look and um, inviting me in today. Um, I suppose a quick background of myself, really. So. Um, Currently, I'm a PhD student at Monash University. My work at the moment there is more about uh, physical activity participation um, in leisure centres, so um, with a specific focus on older adults. So, but previous, uh, as was said, I've done a bit of work um, uh, on, yeah, the, I suppose the employment and the retention issues within our industry at the moment. Obviously, before I kick off, there's a few people I've got to acknowledge, I haven't done all this work on my own. So um, from Monash University, there is Professor Ruth Jeans uh, from Victoria University is uh, Dr. John Tower and Eric Schwartz. And uh, a few of you might know the name of Eric Du from Learn to Swim Victoria. Um, we sort of all work together at this point um, and to get all these studies across the line. This is about four years worth of work, um, all this sort of stuff. Um, on the right there, you can sort of see the aims that all the studies that, I've, um, that I did. So the first one was looking at lifeguard turnover in Victoria aquatic and recreation centres, and that was a bit of a manager's point of view. Um, and then had a bit of a look at in investigating the causes of swim instructor turnover in the aquatics industry. Um, had a look at some human resource retention strategies to reduce swim instructor turnover. And then wanted to further understand the lifeguard uh, recruitment and selection practices uh, within our centre. So the work you'll see presented here is sort of a combination of everything put together, all our findings and all that sort of thing. All right. Uh, again, over the last, I suppose, three or four years, um, had a look at a lot of literature and stuff to work out what's really happening within our industry at the moment. Um, and this is probably the easiest way to put it. So... Um, I would suggest at the moment it's definitely a culture of employee turnover and it's basically characterised by the acceptance that employer turnover is part of the norm, uh, that they believe that employer turnover and turnover behaviour are quite appropriate, normal and is basically the status quo. And that flows all the way through uh, your frontline staff all the way up. As I said, this is widespread, at, uh, widespread across the aquatic industries um, and that has come through from managers, uh, frontline employees, the casuals, the part-time, even the full-time, middle management, operation staff, swim school management, and then up to the top to centre managers and assistant centre managers. As I go through these slides, I want to I want to present probably a few quotes um, that led me to these sort of conclusions. Um, the first one here, uh, I'll start with the managers, is that I think the key is that the job in aquatics are not a career in the most part. They are jobs you can only do for a certain period before they become boring and unappealing. So that was from one of the managers I spoke to. Um, and then one of the swim instructor, there is no career progression. You are sort of stuck at a level. You sort of do your time and then you leave on your own accord or you're tossed to the side in the sense. The hours might, re might be reduced and so on. I think the final thing I want to touch on this slide is that um, for employees, they don't go into the industry saying, oh, I'm going to leave in two years' time. That's developed through their experience, their relationships with staff, their relationships with colleagues, uh, and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I'll leave that one there for the moment. Something also I've noticed, do a bit of reading in that, I think there's a bit of a disconnect, and, uh, as from the first quote, uh, there's a bit of a disconnect around the term career. Um, particularly if you look at industry versus management. So, again, I took, a, I took a, on the weekend, I just took down a couple of things within 
Um, it would have, might have been LSV or Royal Life, I think. But they state here, it's a great industry to get involved with lots of opportunities to grow your career and make a meaningful impact in your community. The aquatics industry in Victoria is a vibrant and rewarding industry. It is exciting and diverse career. The career opportunities are endless, they say. Back to what management say. It's not really a career pathway. The turnover comes when they find work elsewhere or they move into their career. I think, it's, I think the key is in the aquatics industry, it's not a career in the most part. So we probably have a retention rate of two to three years if everything is going well. For me, a uh, big disconnect at the moment between what's been said by industry and even the mindset at the moment of um, our management. Uh, so when I went in to have a look at, I suppose, discover the turnover intention, before I go into our results though, I will read a few quick definitions here of how we come to what we mean by uh, turnover intention. So intention is the nearest variable to the real behavior that someone will do. Turnover intention is one of the final stages before employee take the initiative to leave their employment. And turnover intention can be seen from several perspectives, such as a tendency to leave the organization, the possibility of finding another job, the possibility of an employee seeing themselves out of the organization, both now or in the near future. So again, this is all not horrible news that I'm going to throw at you guys today. Um, so the first thing I did, and the bit, I think my surprising results really for me were there was definitely a clear distinction between turnover intention versus age, uh, according to age. So I asked the question basically, how often um, do you consider leaving the position? Um, and this was specific for swim instructors. So younger swim instructors, typical answers often, all the time, sometimes. Uh, for the older swim instructors, and I've grouped them at 45 plus, never, not often. Um, as I said before, the younger swim instructors, this attitude is developing within uh, once they make their way into the industry, and they, there is a massive perception there's no career in this industry. All right, that's basically what they say. Um, and it's going to—I'm going to come in a little bit more regarding relationships. Uh, it's going to be a big focus of this presentation, but. Um, something younger swim instructors are not able to do is just manage the stresses of the position and they're not able to overcome negative, uh, I suppose, negative relationships that include colleagues and management. On the good side though, older swim, instruction, older swim instructors, they are definitely more resilient to what happens within our industry. They can put up with management, they can put up with a crappy relationship with a colleague. They're there to basically contribute. And that's, again, something I've taken from the literacy is the word uh, contribute. So contributing to society is a crucial motivation. And uh, while well, money to them is much less important at this point. Um, they want to just, uh, they want to be out there to demonstrate their experience and transfer their knowledge and skills to um, their younger generation. So that's including some staff, but it's also including those little kids they got within the class. As you can tell, I don't, have never done swim instructing as well. Looks terrible. I suppose the purpose of these studies was more about a, uh, trying to get a perception of what's happening, uh, trying to get points of view and ideas of what's going on in the industry. Um, so I suppose it wasn't to evaluate current strategies in reducing turnovers. I really didn't even look at what the strategies, what the current strategies are at this point. Um, Instead, we look for perception and point of view. We asked about the perception of management handling turnover, and there was uh, two big things that come across. Now, as I said, I wasn't there to evaluate, and I'm gonna say if there is any current strategies at the moment being implemented to retain staff, they do not know about it. They have no idea, all right? Um, this is not flowing down to lower levels. They have no idea what's happening. But uh, probably a bigger concern I think I found was that the swim instructors actually think management don't care about staff leaving and believe it, it's very much profit before people. That's the perspective that's coming across. Um, and I've just chosen two uh, quotes that I got. So it's a business to them. I think they just hire new people when they leave. I don't know if they really do anything to try and retain people, I guess. I also don't think they really care about it. Um, second quote, yeah, I don't think that the management are doing anything proactively. Actually, I don't think they give a S. Uh, it's all about the dollars for them. It's probably easier and cheaper to just keep replacing swim teachers than trying to keep them at this point. Now, uh, this is sort of, sort of now starts to, starts to touch on strategies that we could possibly be doing to sort of 
start to overcome the issues we have. And the first one is a realistic job preview, um, which is just basically given current staff and uh, new employees an exact look at what's going on. It was sort of touched on in the last presentation about working conditions. Um, so there is currently a massive underestimating, uh, I'll put it in brackets and a question mark there, I can let you guys decide on this, where the managers or employees or both are, under, are underestimating the requirements of the swim teaching role and or uh, minimal information provided by management. So a lot of these staff are going in, they have their training and whatnot, but um, they are not enjoying the working conditions at all. Uh, that's a big reason here for the turnover. Uh, the biggest concerns relate to, as I said, working conditions. And the big points here were expectation to work more shifts. And I suppose that's coming about because of a shortage. So it's a big circle at this point. Um, the long hours, inconsistencies with breaks and discomfort of hours in the pool. I don't know as an industry we want to be portraying that as our industry, but that's currently what it's that's currently what it looks like to uh, swim instructors. So I think we fix that, then we reevaluate what our realistic job preview is, and then we present that. But I think it's a bit of work to do at that point. Um, but in terms of retaining staff, um, a realistic job preview, as I said, is just providing all staff exactly what exactly what they're getting into. So for potential employees, uh, example of all their expected duties, uh, all information given, including details of the less glamorous duties of the role. And again, this is about that, I suppose, uh, idea of promotion or learning and all that sort of thing, but observational opportunities. What are other people doing within the role? Uh, what are other people doing within the centre? And start to have a look at what we can do there. Um, again, retaining existing staff. So this is very much important for, I suppose, the younger employees. As I said, older employees at the moment, they just want to sort of want to give back to the industry, give back um, to society, I suppose. Younger people are a little bit more, I want this, I want that, what's, what's this going to do for me? Um, give it to me now, basically. So they want to know that you guys are valuing them. Um, they want to know that you guys are thinking about them and what the future looks like for them. So roundtable discussions to improve a sense of career path. Um, Again, that's similar again, observations, previews of other roles and uh, mentoring opportunities. Again, it just feeds these younger employees the idea, we're looking out for you, we want to put time into you, we value you, those sort of things. I'll quickly read out the couple quotes relating to the job preview. Uh, I'll just read out one here. I probably didn't understand the extreme nature of teaching often no real breaks and the discomfort with being in the pool for long hours. I didn't stay for a long time. The hair and skin issues with being in the water was an example there. Next slide here, it, two biggest things I think that I've taken away from my research and this other one is basically um, and perceived is the word there because I wasn't there, to, wasn't there to critique management. That wasn't the part of this research, wasn't my job. I was getting that point of view and the ideas from our frontline employees. Um, so, big underline is perceived poor management and leadership. So, um, I'll start obviously just a little bit of theory here, but we know it's very, very important. Um, it's well, yeah, it's well documented, well documented that leaders and management practices affect employee turnover and retention. That's huge. Um, as I said, it's well documented. Employee turnover can be initiated by the instability in management of an organisation. Specifically here includes poor management, leadership of swim school managers, uh, identified swim teachers. So yeah, that's what I've taken from my research here. Uh, a lot of this poor management idea or poor leadership has come from um, their direct manager, I suppose. Um, and employees are more motivated to work and remain when the organisation is stable in a pleasant work environment. Now, I'm gonna, I've chosen three quotes here. Um, that I think really sum up what these swim instructors said to me. And I'll read through them. Yeah, so this specific manager sat right next to me, uh, sat, right, sat right next to my class as I was doing my class and watched me for a good two to three hours. And at the end of the session, basically had a list and went through every single little thing they wanted to change. This was not a one-off. She'll do this multiple times. I had quite a few years experience and this process 
felt belittling and really lowered morale. Second quote, I don't think management always have enough time and enough care to actually look at the background in everybody and get to know who is who. Also, management need to consider that we are the ones out the front doing the work with management just in the background. Final quote, they talk, they talk, the culture, they in management, but where I came from, the culture was extremely toxic and I could not just work in that sort of environment. Management was a clique. They looked after themselves first and foremost. One manager, I just wanted to slap her over the head every time I looked at her. She was hopeless. It didn't matter what you confronted her about, she just blows you off every time. So this next slide, it was amongst other things, but I think these two were the biggest standouts, I suppose. When I looked at specifically the recruitment process and the way the industry is recruiting, there was two things, and I think, it, again, it was touched on in the last presentation. I agree 100%. I really think there's no forecasting. There's no actual planning of turnover. There's no history. We're not keeping track records of anything. It's very much a come summer, we hire, come into summer, we throw them out sort of approach, and that's sort of coming through as well. And I thought this was quite interesting on the left-hand side. Um, some managers with personal bias, I'll highlight that there, some managers refuse to recruit lifeguards under the age of 18 years old, citing maturity and experience. Um, and again, I found that very interesting being that I went and had a look and an industry recommends at the age of 16. So for me, what are we doing that two year gap? What's happening at that point? Um, and at one point, I nearly wrote up a paper about age discrimination based on that, but I thought, I better not do that yet. Um, but yeah, so something else there to think about. So I had a chat with swim instructors and what do they actually want? And I think some of these findings might headbutt a little bit with what management say, I hope. Um, it's probably a good thing, really. Um, but I will read through the... Uh, I'll go through the board. Um, so at the moment, a lot of these staff feel like they're walking on that eggshells, um, as a few of them said it. Um, they know, for some reason, it was a really weird conversation. They know the industry's in a shortage, but they still think they're going to get the sack at some point. So I'm not sure how that works. We don't have staff, but they think they're still going to get thrown out. So that doesn't work. Um, and yeah, as I said, being replaced. Um, they want their managers to be present and available. As I, I think in the other quote, it said... Manager just behind the scenes, that's the interpretation they get. This was something I didn't really find within the literature or anything, but it's something that came through, was uh, equal treatment and recognition. And that was based on casuals versus part-time. They are suggesting that part-time and full-time staff are like a level above the casuals. So they feel casuals are more undervalued, uh, not appreciated, um, that sort of thing. Improved communication was a big one too. As I said, managers, they feel management aren't there, but the, uh, the, the, the communication also needs to improve. And um, again, appreciated and invested in. Um, and this is not new, as I found a royal life, pretty much found the same thing back in 2020. So this is not brand new news. Um, it's been around for a bit. And again, I'll read, I'll read two quotes that sort of, I think, sum up what they want quite nicely. They should create a kind of community feel. They should get to know their employees, a manager or organisation that makes sure everyone is comfortable, the needs are being met, freedom to come up with new ideas and as a team. Uh, that was a big one. So that idea of freedom, being, a, being able to talk, being able to present ideas, being able to just approach management and share their thoughts. Um, opportunities to discuss and contribute. What works well, what does not. Managers that meet us on the swim teacher level. Management needs to look up and look at what their staff are about and actually see what experiences they had, they have, and what they can bring to the party. Management should engage staff and bring them into the party and get them utilising their full potential. Management should try and be available instead of just being non-existent. They needed to be friendly and approachable. Final slide. Um, now, these sort of strategies here that I've put up, it really focuses on, I suppose, the two biggest findings, which would be what younger employees want and the biggest issue 
that I found was issues with management and leadership. Before I go to them, I did notice within all those Slido things, um, the issue of money come up. Um, I think it's obviously widely accepted that there's probably inconsistencies with where you work and where you get paid. Um, I did a quick look on the weekend because I knew I was doing this, but I think somewhere I could have got $40 and somewhere I could have got $22. Um, management think that's an issue. I tend to disagree. I did not find that at all when I spoke to staff. Yeah, as I said, staff think, sorry, management had cited plenty of times that their uh, pays could be an issue, but even sometimes um, I found that these employees didn't even know you could get more money elsewhere. Um, and I know for older adults, they don't care about the money. Um, and for younger people, they just want to feel valued at this point. I, yeah, I will sit, I'll stand here and say today, the money is not an issue um, within our industry. Uh, it's more about the way, we, the way we deal with these staff, the way they feel engaged in the organisation and not that sort of thing. But I'm happy to have that argument with managers if they want. Um, so as I said, these, these things on the board here, they relate straight back to um, that idea about uh, improved leadership and management and then how we can deal with younger employees to keep them for that a little bit longer. So the first one is exit interviews. They probably are done at a higher level within our organisations, um, but I've worked in the industry for 10 years on and off, plus whatever it is now, maybe 15, um, and I don't think they're happening at that very lower level. I think we should probably start to introduce these, not every time, not every time one a young kid leads the organisation, but um, maybe every few, and just get a bit of an understanding of why these young people, um, why these young people actually leave in. I, had a, I heard someone say to me a few years back that um, one guy, one young employee left and wanted to have a chat with, his, with the centre manager about it, um, explain what, his, what, what, what he went through and his experiences and anything he could provide. The centre manager just laughed it off and basically said, I don't want to hear what this guy says. I thought, hmm, interesting. Um, but again, is that something that is why we are sort of, sort of this far down the track now? So exit interviews. Um, have a few important things that we get from them. Uh, monitor and analyse employee turnover. Identify management training uh, needs and any issues. And recognise positive as aspects of the organisation that you might be able to replicate across other sites or other departments within your um, facility. Uh, the big one here, I think, is middle management training. That's probably, what am I trying to say here? Uh, Swim coordinators, operation staff, I think. Um, they need to learn how to lead and develop effective relationships. They need to improve their communication, 100%. Um, and they need a bit more work on talent management. So planning, attracting, developing and retaining staff. That, I think, is going to be the biggest takeaway from the three to four years that I've spent doing this stuff. Middle management, whether it's a time thing, um, whether it's money, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but that's something that has to be considered. Um, I think our management need to reflect on their leadership style um, and see if we can adapt and respond to challenges. So, for example, that what we're dealing with at the moment, lack of staff, employee turnover. Um, identify management behaviour. So that's through maybe through that self-reflection. Identify management behaviour and, and see... Uh, sorry, identify management behaviour patterns and how managers seek to influence others. So thinking back, how do you guys or how do we do our job? Can we do anything a little bit differently at this point? And basically, as I said before, and I'll repeat it again, younger employees just want to be loved, I think. Um, tell them you care about them. Tell them you're doing this for them. Show them this. Invite them to this. All this sort of stuff. Provide on and off the job training and upskilling. Um, as probably in the brackets there, most important, education is very, very important to younger kids. Um, they think well ahead, where older adults think, what can I do now to give back to society? It's sort of an opposite thing. So yeah, that's it, guys. Uh, they're my, that's all my work to this point.
So we will be um, shortly bringing on Sean Jackson. He is a representative of RLSSA um, based up in Sydney. He's gone through and um, delved into a lot of research regarding where we are um, as an industry, where we are statistically as a workforce. It's a really um, comprehensive report. I'm just going to work on um, gathering him onto Teams. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it through in person, so he's going to tune in um, remotely. But the information that he is going to come through and bring across, which I've seen is um, really relevant and actually ask questions um, to myself in my previous time uh, working within the leisure. Um, had I had access to some of these numbers, it might have actually changed the way that I was looking at bringing teams on board um, and who was actually going to, you know, stick around for the long term and actually create those um, those strategies which we seek to find. Thanks for having me, um, Alec and Chris. And uh, I was just listening in on uh, Chris, I think that was Chris's presentation. Or So, yeah, a lot of similar themes. But um, I'll just quickly kind of give a bit of a background to the project we um, we commenced in 2019 and, and then feed into some more specific data around duty managers, lifeguards, and, and swim teachers. Um, so um, it was the National Aquatic Industry Workforce Development Project um, managed by Royal, Royal Life Saving on behalf of the National Aquatic Industry Committee. And um, it, it really had three objectives to achieve and share greater insight and understanding of the industry workforce. Um, to build the capacity and capability of the workforce and to support the development of a, a strong, sustainable industry. So what, what it resulted in was a workforce survey in April, May 2019, uh, 61 questions. We had over 3,000 respondents across the country. And the data I'll present today is, is uh, national data, not, not specific to any state or territory. Then we produced a workforce profile from, from um, analysing that data. So the profile focused on demographic and general employment information, um, really just profiling the workforce, funny that. And the workforce report was in July 2020, um, and that focused more on the qualitative stuff, like employment experience, quals and skills being brought to the roles, health, safety, degrees of change, um, location and, and feelings, thoughts, opinions around PD. The workforce report um, was, was a lot more analysis um, and it resulted in, of the data, and it resulted in kind of recommendations around 10 themes, um, around recognition, PD, mentoring, opportunities, regional and remote support, community and diversity, health and safety, reaccreditation, requirements, leadership and management and further research. So towards the end of the report, we, we, um, we made recommendations on each, on each of those themes for the industry. And we, we've also since developed some PD products um, based, on, based on some of the input that we got around, you know, most preferred or most desired PD um, products. So at this point, I'll just say that obviously um, COVID came along um, early 2020 and um, kind of put a pause on, on the project in terms of acting on the recommendations, uh, obviously because the industry wasn't what it was when we commenced the project. For, for a while there, there really was no industry in, in a lot of states or, you know, chiefly New South Wales and Victoria. So um, we, we went ahead with publishing the report um, in 2020, um, right in the middle of COVID, but we kind of put a caveat that obviously things have changed dramatically and um, and things, you know, will need to be re-looked at even when we come out of COVID, which thankfully, seemingly, we are now. Just if you're after further information um, about the workforce profile or the report, you can access both documents at the at our National uh, Royal Life Saving website um, at the Aquatic Risk and Guidelines um, tab, and you can see there that's just a screenshot of the site, and um, you can download the reports or, or view them in the online reader format. 
Um, so, so worth a look there. Okay, what did the profile and the report tell us about key roles in the industry? Um, so I'll just spend the next kind of 10 minutes talking through that and then touch on some, some next steps um, that I hope you find insightful. I'll, I'll race through the next few slides because I, I um, want to kind of collate them. Uh, I'll bring some of the key themes together. So probably not a lot of surprises for you guys, um, but swim teachers, what, what we really drew out was predominantly female. Um, an interesting age gap, you know, there was 23% 18 to 24 and 23% 45 to 54 with um, with an even spread in between, but but that was a bit unique to swim teaching. Um, casually employed 70%. 70 to 69% working less than 16 hours per week. Um, most or more, more than half have a second job, half are studying. And interestingly, 40% think they'll stay in the role six years or more. And that's interesting when we look at, say, pool lifeguard. Um, similarly dominated by females in our survey, um, but not quite to the extent of swim teacher. Predominantly young, uh, again, high casual rate, again, more than half working less than 16 hours a week. Uh, many have a second job, many are studying uh, while working, and only 23% think they'll stay in the role six years or more. So note that swim teacher was at 40%, so almost double um, what lifeguards think. Uh, the, other, the other one I thought we'd drill down into this little presentation was the duty manager. So uh, unlike previous two, which, um, majority are male. Um, there was quite an even spread of ages. Um, again, high casual rates, uh, obviously work um, um, more weeks a year and work more hours a week, greater than 23 hours a week, which is not surprising um, compared to swim teachers and lifeguards. 66% um, have been working in this room more than six years. Um, again, a little surprising that nearly half have a second job or are studying while working. Um, and similar to swim teachers, 40% think they'll stay in the role six years or more. Okay, so I think, yeah, the next screen just tries to kind of highlight some of the similarities and differences. Um, obviously, predominantly female for swim teachers in particular. Um, and we think that's reflected in the age, you know, the age is perhaps working uh, before having a family and then um, once the family is growing up. And even, um, even spread of ages for duty manager, pool lifeguards are generally younger, high casual rate across the industry. I think it was 71% across the, all roles in the industry. Um, and then the, you know, 70% working less than 16 hours a week for swim teachers. Uh, whereas quite the opposite for uh, duty managers. Um, and then I think with swim teachers, what we can draw out of it is that they, they, they want to stay in the role. They want to stay in industry, whereas lifeguards, it, it is more a transient role. Um, and duty managers, obviously, if they're progressing beyond being a lifeguard into other roles, more likely to want to or think they will stay, stay in the industry um, six years or more. So with, with a lot of this data, folks, um, it, it gets broken down quite a bit more in the reports and the, in the profile, but um, I'll just spend the next few screens um, breaking down little bits of it a little more. Um, so we asked workers, what do they value? And look, this was really interesting, and I think this touches on the previous presentation. Um, far and away, uh, positive and collegial work environment was valued most, um, along with pay and work conditions um, and employees financially supporting mandatory reaccreditation requirements. So, so respondents rated these as important or very important. Um, and I thought it was, we thought it was interesting that um, this po positive and collegial work environment comes through really strongly in all the roles um, and even ahead of pay and work conditions. Uh, okay, uh, what do swim teachers value most? Um, I thought, so what, what, I hope you can see this screen, all right. Um, 
the orange and the blue, orange is most important, the blue is um, important, and the yellow is somewhat important. And we can see that, and so this, 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 these charts are presented um, with the most important at the top, but we can see that um, if we consider important, somewhat important, important and very important, um, clearly positive collegial work environment is, is important for all, but so, um, but so are items such as greater access to PD and training opportunities, and this came through strongly for swim teachers, um, and even more research to underpin knowledge and best practice, again, came through in the commentary from swim teachers as well. So that's just a couple of other points um, where you know they have rated them as as important to some degree. Um, also, improved health and safety conditions uh, was was brought up commonly in the swim teacher commentary. Um, so that's something to think about as well. I'll keep moving quickly. So, what did lifeguards value most? Again, look, all of them are all of them valuing positive collegial work environment. Um, employers financially supporting reaccreditation and um, greater access to PD and training opportunities also came through if we look at the yellow, the blue and the orange, um, along with some other ones, but again, uh, similar themes. Duty managers were, were a little bit different. They had improved pay and work conditions as, as either somewhat important, very important, with no one kind of, not one of them thought it was unimportant. Again, work environment is up there, um, along with, um, again, we see great strong, uh, access to PD and PD, access to training and PD opportunities, as well as job security, which, yeah, came through quite strongly. Okay. So what do workers most enjoy? And I think this touches on the previous presentation around the value fit and, and appealing to workers, um, retaining workers because you are making them uh, feel like they're making a difference because the, the far and away the, 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 the strongest response was making a positive impact on people's lives, followed by being part of a team, interacting with clients and customers. Uh, we'll get to that in, in the latter slide. So swim teachers, interestingly, quite clearly um, making a positive impact on people's lives was a... Um, was a winner and in the commentary, because um, one of the final questions in the survey was, you know, any other comments, a lot of swim teachers commented on um, the, the fact that they feel like, you know, um, enabling, seeing kids learn to swim, knowing that they're safe around water because water of the work they do, et cetera, was really important and satisfying for them. And I think perhaps sometimes we just need to uh, as managers and leaders in the industry, remind remind them of the good work they're doing there in that space because that's what's important. So swim teachers, yeah, acquiring new skills, interacting with clients, customers, being part of a team. Lifeguards, being part of a team, interesting, interestingly, um, came through as most, in, most enjoyed. Um, positive impact on people live, in, interacting with clients and customers, working with colleagues, learning new skills. Uh, interestingly, duty managers said they most enjoyed dealing with a variety of tasks and situations, which uh, uh, I think is a key part of their role, obviously. Um, and then sim similarly, being part of a team, a positive impact on, on people's lives. And keep, okay, reasons for leaving. So um, clearly not enough work hours available it was, was the main reason across the industry, across all roles, and then the structural challenges around the seasonal nature of the work and, and you know, perceived poor pay or lack of career opportunity um, also came through as the strongest reasons. Uh, swim teachers clearly said that not enough work hours available. Um, and I suppose that's a challenge of the role there. Uh, we can see that seasonal nature of work and poor pay are also a factor. Uh, lifeguards, again, the seasonal nature of the work, not enough work hours available, um, again, came in ahead of poor pay. So it's it's not so much the pay rate, it's it's the consistency of work, which is a challenge for, for the industry. Um, 
And duty managers, again, were a little bit different, um, perhaps in a more permanent role, um, and they felt that poor pay or remuneration was, was more of an issue, and followed by lack of career opportunity, which was a little, again, a little bit different um, to swim teachers and lifeguards. So critical skills for success, probably no surprises here, um, and I, um, this is just generally communication skills, customer service and, and, and teamwork skills were identified across the industry as the most critical skills. I think problem solving was not, not far behind. And then we just asked about PD and I suppose focus here, 60% of the industry agreed that PD helps motivate workers to stay in the industry. Um, and there was quite an even spread of, of the amount of PD people were doing, um, one, two and three especially sessions a year. The preferred PD topics now, I just will note here that of the 3,091 respondents, I think around a third were swim teachers, which is reflective of um, the industry in that we estimate of the about 70,000 in the industry, about 30,000 are swim teachers. Um, so swim teaching skills came through across the workforce, but notice things like conflict management, communication skills, leadership and management, uh, team building, um, health and safety also came through across all roles. Um, if we focus in on swim teachers, Obviously, they're more focused on the swim teaching elements, infants and babies, disabilities, swim swim correction, autism, um, but then communication, leadership and management. I think um, conflict management is somewhere quite large as well, um, came through quite strongly. Lifeguards were, um, again, highly interested in learning more about and developing their skills around conflict management, um, communication, tech ops, um, and then the, the core skills of the role, first aid, rescue techniques, uh, not, not surprising there. Duty managers, uh, conflict management, health and safety, um, the tech ops part of the role, you know, career advancement into facility management um, and leadership and management. So the question there was, what are your preferred PD topics? And then we just collated their responses to make, to make the word clouds. Obviously, the larger the text, the more uh, respondents gave those topics. Yeah, okay. So what does all this mean? What are the key takeaways? And this is where I think the similar themes to, to Chris before. Items crucial for enjoyment, motivation and retention are making a positive impact. So what, what we have here, folks, are, is an altruistic, empathetic workforce. They care about other people. They care about the difference they're making. And I think we need to keep that in mind if we want to keep staff happy and motivated. Um, they're sociable people. They like, they like to interact. They like to be connected. They like to be part of a team and a community. Again, important for us to, rem to remember that. Learning new things uh, um, like any, in any role, in any profession, in any industry, but especially probably for, um, for perhaps younger people to keep them in the roles um, and to keep them interested is um, to keep them doing PD and feeling like they're progressing and learning. And that's where you can access older, more experienced staff in mentoring relationships. Um, key takeaway, PD, PD motivates, it fosters buy-in, it fosters appreciation and enjoyment. So what are the reasons for leaving? Well, these, these are more structural challenges that are really big picture issues for the industry. Uh, not enough work hours, seasonal work, poor pay. Okay, so that's, that's a challenge. How do we solve that my kind of our advice or where we've got to and where we want to continue work with the NAIC now that COVID is hopefully behind us is to really seek seek a value fit um, interrogate their values you know your potential employees values prior to employment ask a couple more questions around that and just see if, if there's going to be a fit there because if there isn't for sure it, it won't work out um, and I think to touch on the point made earlier, um, being really realistic about the requirements of the role and being upfront about that and, and um, providing visibility and opportunities to see the role in action feeds into that value fit um, proposition as well. It's a little different, but equally important. Um, solutions, support early, connect to a mentor. 
what really came through in the survey really strongly was there's a lot of very experienced industry people that want to share their skills and experience and knowledge. They want to mentor people. And there's a lot of young staff that are, are unsure if, if this is the industry for them. They want to learn. They want to find out. We have to make those connections. Um, we have to put those people together through mentoring relationships. Um, in my previous life, in a different role, I was fortunate enough to be very closely mentored at the beginning of, of my career in a, different, in a different career, and it made a huge difference. And I stayed in, in that industry for, for about 10, 12 years, um, because of, largely because I was fortunate enough to be really closely mentored right at the beginning and really well mentored. Um, of course, offer multi-role positions, you know, to address the, the not enough work hours, the seasonal work. Um, can swim teachers work as lifeguards, as duty managers, as customer service and vice versa? Offer PD opportunities regularly and foster a value fit mission and workplace and be loud and proud about it. So my point there is that, yes, you want you want a value fit, but you want to remind staff that there is that fit in place and that what they're doing is is connecting to those values and what's important to them because that easily gets forgotten in the busyness of it all. Um, and that's what I'm saying, be loud and proud about it. Remind, um, make sure your mission statement aligns with the values of your staff and then remind them that the work they're doing is, is achieving that mission and it is making a difference to communities and to people's lives. Um, they need to hear that. Um, of course, acknowledge, congratulate, and, and um, do so in a value fit way. So um, perhaps instead of instead of saying, you know, reporting on the success of the business and the, the profit margin or something from the larger organization, um, report back on the difference it made to people's lives, a case study or a story, or in, uh, report back and acknowledge on the work they were interested in knowing, not not perhaps in a more um, in a more a business sense, which perhaps doesn't really appeal to to a lot of your swim teachers or, or lifeguards. Um, I hope I made that point clearly. So next steps is to ensure that COVID is in the rearview mirror, mirror well and truly, which it seems to be. The NAIC and Royal National Office, we need to kind of act on the recommendations in the report um, and recruit, look at recruitment, retention and reward strategies. Um, some pick some targets there, and then update insights and understanding of the workforce now that we've come out of the other end of COVID, um, and we're looking to do this through through state of the industry reports and and similar pieces of work and and you know further further surveying to update that data and understand where the industry is now and the workforce is now um, as as we've come out of the pandemic. That is it from me. I hope you got all of that. Um, so next up, we've got Andy Dennis, um, who is our general manager of training um, and aquatics industry. And he's going to come along and present um, some initiatives that has been uh, put towards in the background with Lifesaving Victoria um, and some other um, updated resources that will soon become uh, available to you. So thank you, Andy. A lot of new faces. We know that there are challenges. Um, we know the research is telling us that Pay is a problem, pay isn't a problem. How do we do, deal with PD? Um, what I'd suggest is that we focus on some of the, the running themes here and we start to, um, whilst taking everything with a pinch of salt, because I think we're getting sort of, we're getting some of the extremes here. Um, we need to look at what those themes are across the board. What are the patterns? What can we actually learn from? Um, I don't believe having met a lot of managers in my time here that managers don't give a shit, but um, if that's what the staff are thinking and if that's what they're prepared to say, we can't ignore that. Okay, so we've just got a bit of a proverbial kick up the backside um, from some of the research, but um, we've got a really good opportunity to look to, look to start building things um, as, we, as we move into the future. My role sits across training in aquatic industry services, which gives me a really, um, a really useful insight because I understand what's coming from a GSPO perspective, from a National Aquatic Industry Committee perspective. Um, and ultimately, my obligation is to try and make sure that the training we're providing is ultimately what the industry wants and needs. Okay, so um, 
it's the reason we introduced the ATO course about six years ago, because we knew it was coming into the GSPO. It's the reason we introduced the swim teacher course and the extension courses about three years ago, because we knew that there was a bit of dissatisfaction in that part of the world. Okay, um, so I wanna talk about a few initiatives um, that we've got going, but I just wanna quickly reflect on, on two pieces in my recruitment journey. Um, firstly, I came out of a, I got a sport and leisure degree out of a university in the UK, um, and I went straight onto a two year um, graduate program with a, a YMCA type charity company that ran all the leisure centers in, um, in London. Now, when you've got that many leisure centers that close because you've got a 12 million population, it, it gives you a bit of an opportunity that maybe might not translate over here, but what that program did, and I'm still stuck in the industry almost 20 years later on, um, there's 12 of us on the program, um, straight out of university, straight onto a, a sort of a normalish um, or low London salary at the time. We spent the first year getting trained and then doing frontline jobs. So we did the pool lifeguard course over there is six days, and then we were a lifeguard for two months. We'd do the fitness instructor course, we'd be a fitness instructor for two months. The second year of that program, we did supervisory posts, we were duty managers, we were working in the creche, we were working head office roles. And then if you complete the program, you ultimately go into a middle management post in one of the facilities. Okay, so that's my journey. Um, straight out of uni at, at 21, still here a little while, a little while later. So that organization thought outside the box. Um, and I think the majority of people from that program, and there's an intake every year, I reckon about half the people from my program, which was a fair while ago now, are still there working in that industry. Their skills that they've been honing over the better part of 20 years are still being retained within that industry. Jumping over to this side of the, of the pond, um, looking at the aquatic industry services team, and I hadn't really thought about this, so I don't think it's, it's because of good planning, but the people that I've recruited um, into the aquatic industry services team um, during my time as the manager have all either come from industry or they've come from within LSV. Okay, I've acknowledged probably a long time ago that none of what we do is rocket science. Okay, it's not hard to do a pool test. It's not hard to open the doors. What's hard in the aquatic industry is that we're the opposite of a nine five, we're actually a five nine. Okay, so finding time to do PD is not easy when the doors are constantly open seven days a week. Okay, so it's not about pool tests, it's not about these things, it's not about the budget. We can do all that sort of stuff. It's the plate spinning exercise of a facility that's as complex and dynamic within the communities that we, that we work within. I wanna just focus on, on that side of thing um, more so than the actual technical stuff. I don't want us to dive into the, any of the technical pieces, but that's the mindset that we need to take. It is, you saw the trends, there's talk about leadership um, and, and those sorts of, you know, nice to have buzzwords, what does it mean? You can do a master's in leadership for two years if you really like. Um, but may not reflect in your, in your salary. So I just want to talk about a few initiatives um, straight, out of, um, straight out of Life Saving um, Victoria. Um, the first one is, is, a, is a change to our training portal. Um, so we've had a training portal for a number of years now and about 100,000 people visit it every year. It's where you find your pool lifeguard course, your first aid course, your CPR course um, and the like. So it worked for us fine. It's still fit for purpose, it's still open today. We'll be taking bookings today, we'll be taking bookings tomorrow. Um, but what we started about a year ago was a process just to try and add some more bulk to that resource. If we know we're getting 100,000 visits a year, we know there's an opportunity in that platform that probably doesn't exist elsewhere. Because people aren't going on it for fun, they're going on it to look for a lifeguard course, look for a swim teacher course and the like. So we know who's going there, we know who they are, we've got all the Google Analytics stuff in the background. So what we've done, is we'll launch it on um, July the 11th is the date. Um, and what we've done is have a really good chat internally about what is it out, what else can we use that platform for? So all events across about six LSV departments that impact the aquatic industry, so aquatic industry services, training, we've got a swimming and water safety team, an education team, a diversity and inclusion team, everything will go into this platform. So my guess is that 100,000 visits a year will probably leap up to about 150,000 visits a year. All of the events, whether they're our workshops, whether they're private events that are sort of invite only, the Platinum Pool Steering Committee, all those sorts of things, will also go here to keep pointing everyone towards this resource. 
we'll make our news and offers um, available here and probably relevant for today, we'll make a free jobs board available here because these people, they are coming on to get the qualifications. They're the people that you want. They're the next cab off the ranks. Um, so what the jobs board will look like, it'll be one of the, we couldn't make it much easier. Um, what will happen is that one of you guys will come in as a management representative for Western Leisure Services, for example. It'll say, what, where's the facility or who's the employer? What's the job? When does the advert close? And where's the link to the sports people or the seek? That's it. Okay. That will pop straight up onto the jobs board. It will obviously vanish after the close date. But what you'll have, again, for no fee, it will take you about 30 seconds to do, is potentially 150 odd thousand people will be on that portal, okay, rather than searching through the sports people stuff where you've got a number of other roles outside of lifeguard, swim teacher, ATO, duty manager, duty supervisor, whatever we call them these days. Okay, so that jobs board, um, we're probably about 30 days away, but everything else will be looking to launch um, on the 11th. What we've also got is an industry library. Okay, again, completely freely available to, to everybody. It will link to our platforms and toolkits, so the safety assessments, the watch around water libraries, all those sorts of things. It will link to all the key reports out of the industry, whether it's our state of sector, whether it's the Victorian drowning report, whether it's reports out of raw life. Um, there's, a, there's a whole section on aquatic industry. There's a whole section on pool supervision, a section on swimming and water safety, a section on water quality, section on OHS, section on inland waterways. So what you'll find is practical resources, such as uh, blank templates that you can use and abuse for things like opening checks, for onboarding, for water testing, all that sort of stuff that a lot of you have got. It's, you know, that sort of stuff is probably not for you guys. It's probably more for the, the regional pools that aren't as resourced as you are. Um, you'll find everything in terms of WorkSafe on there. You'll find everything in terms of coronial reports and recommendations on there. Um, and that's just something that we'll continue to add to and it will be freely available to anybody. So that'll just, that's a, that's a library um, and that'll give you pretty much everything you would need when you're trying to make informed um, decisions. The other one um, is free e-learning, okay? So Sean alluded to some courses that Rural Life um, have done and I want to acknowledge Rural Life and some of the other state and territories um, who have worked with us on this. But ultimately what we'll do for LSV trained pool lifeguards and swim teachers, we obviously know who you are and we know what training you've done with us. Okay, so if someone's done a pool lifeguard course with us, they get tagged in the back end of our learning management system as a pool lifeguard. And that, what that will do is turn on access, free access to all of the e-learnings that we've decided are appropriate for those people. Okay, so this is just some of the stuff that we've got. Um, some stuff, that's, we're obviously targeting swim teachers, pool lifeguard, ATOs, those sorts of things. Um, we've got stuff out of the courses, swimming strokes, uh, teacher of life-saving courses, some stuff specific to um, participants with autism, participants from multicultural communities. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, out of the, um, the rural life-saving resource library, LSV Watch Around Water, LSV Swim Safe. And it will just be available. These are little bite-sized learnings, freely available straight through the portal, your time, your convenience. You get a little certificate when you've done it so you can give it to your boss, all those sorts of things. We've also got some broader bits and pieces. So not just the very, very practical swim teacher, pool lifeguard stuff, okay? Conflict management, um, we'll probably, hopefully we can pull the COVID one down um, at some point. There's some stuff in there for our trainers, vet practitioner information, there's information on communication skills, customer service, fatigue management. I can't read all of them, but you can. Um, and we will presumably make this, this slide pack available um, afterwards. Um, and ultimately, people, again, who have done their training with us, they'll jump into the portal, they'll click on the professional development tab, and everything that is appropriate for them will be available. And they'll just click enroll, they'll just click start, and they can do that at their convenience, okay? We've worked on this for a while. Some of it is off the shelf. Some of it is custom built by us. Some of it is custom built by Rural Life. In particular, the team in New South Wales um, has done a, a lot of work here as well. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we move to some of the broader, the broader skills, business writing, discrimination, fostering teamwork, and the like. So all things that hopefully are partially responding to some of the challenges that have been raised um, this morning in and around some of, the, um, some of the bits and pieces and the feedback that the, the research has found. 
focusing specifically on um, on swim teachers, which we know is the piece that's that's plagued us for the last um, sort of nine months as we've finally come out of the COVID lockdown number 42 or wherever we were. There is federal government money through OSWIM to support retention and return to work of previous swim teachers. So hopefully that money has made itself its way through to yourselves. Jobs Vic um, have provided ASTA, um, and we're probably going back six to nine months now, maybe even longer, over $3 million to assist the industry to identify, train, recruit um, swim teachers. Again, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a swim teacher course that costs about 250 bucks, okay? So some of the challenges that were raised, um, onboarding hours, not being paid for, not having money for this, this, and this, that, that ASTA money is intended to, co to cover all of those costs. It's an acknowledgement that there's a bit more to becoming a swim teacher than just the course. There are costs of resources, there are costs of overheads, there are costs of uniform, there are costs of the onboarding hours. Everyone should be getting paid for onboarding hours. I'm not, a, I'm not a specialist in legislation, but I'm pretty sure that's the law. Um, LSV, we haven't had any funding um, at this point, um, but we have offered free training. We've partnered with YMCA Belgravia um, and Aligned Leisure um, about, about a year ago to train 240 swim teachers for free. Um, there's been some targeted training through our diversity and inclusion team focusing on older adults and people from multicultural backgrounds. Um, and we're obviously coming to the back end of our swim teacher um, discount. Um, the good news is that there's more money coming. Um, so Department of Youth, that may not be their official name, um, there is money coming through Sport and Rec Victoria. I believe it's in, in and around the $1.2, $1.3 million. Again, targeting swim teachers and a similar project coming through um, where the funding will get come through ARV to yourselves, okay? My take is that I think some of it will be for, some of it will come to the facilities first and you guys will get told, contact LSV, contact OSWIM and organize a course and we'll then give you the money. Some of it, I believe, will go to the end users. Okay, so there's, there is money, big money, that's been put in from government to support this challenge. And we will continue to push government uh, on the advocacy front through the research uh, out of our swimming and water safety team, um, which ties into a whole bunch of other strategies and projects that we're working on. Longer term, um, COVID will go at some point. There'll be another disease for us to worry about further down the track. We're currently working with Chisholm, who have a skills first contract. And between us and Chisholm, we have got the swim teacher course onto that funded course list. So what's happening is that we will set up ultimately a training partnership with Chisholm, and then we will be in a position to offer free swim teacher training course. Okay, so that is our long-term um, priority one um, project. We've also met with a company called Head Start in the, a couple of times in the last couple of months. Um, and what they will do is take that administrative burden off of you guys and they will work to, part, to pair kids who are getting towards the end, the 16, 17, 18 year olds, partner them and you guys at a facility level to get those kids into your facilities, okay? And again, that includes the training all being paid for and those sorts of things. It's under an apprentice model. Okay, that's probably the one that's a bit further down the track. And once we're fully across exactly what that looks like, we will, we will attempt to contact every single facility and say, this is what it is, this is how it works, this is how you can get involved. Okay, so we wanna be here to provide this solution because obviously taking off my sort of industry hat, putting on my water safety hat, we need to start these kids through. We know that there's wait lists, we know that there's challenges, and we know that swim teachers um, are, a, are a part of the challenge. I won't jump too much into the older adults and, and the diversity and inclusion piece because I believe there's a presentation later on coming out of that team. Um, and there's also a piece of work coming out of our swimming and water safety team in partnership with some industry consultations on the pathways and on the, on the retention piece. There is no point putting on a whole bunch of free training courses if everyone just leaves after nine months. It's great for, it's great for LSV training department, but it's not great for the industry, okay? And we've got to get those two um, to come together. So there is a plan um, for the swim teacher um, piece. It would be remiss of me um, not to just make sure that um, people are across the fact that we offer swim teacher training. Um, there's a lot of job adverts um, that refer to specific providers rather than the actual swimming and water safety skill set, which is the official qualification that is required under the, um, the GSPO. So 
I won't bang on about it too much, but if you are a swim teacher with LSV, um, it includes free CPR training each year with LSV. It obviously comes with a three yearly industry license, which is pretty standard now across the board because it's now in the GSPO. It includes a three yearly membership with LSV. It obviously includes the e-learning that I touched on. It is na nationally recognized <coughs> training. Okay, we are an RTO. We have an entire team that makes sure that we are compliant. And anybody that tells me that they're, they're not nationally recognized, I'd be interested in having a phone call, um, a phone call with them. We're fully compliant with the GSPO section, which was introduced as part of the new supervision section and the swimming and water safety program section. Um, it's aligned with the national swimming and water safety framework out of rural life. It includes 50% off of our first aid and mental health first aid courses. There's no lock in, no lock out. Okay, so if you take an LSV piece of paper to some providers, they make it difficult for you initially to get in. If you tell them it's nationally recognized, they haven't got a choice, they basically have to accept it. Um, but if someone comes to us with an ASTA qualification and it's the right qualification, that's fine. If they want to come on board because of free CPR courses, that's great. Not a problem. Okay, we don't need to realistically make any money out of this. Okay, what we want to do is resolve the problem and support the swimming and water safety challenge that we're currently facing uh, in Victoria. Um, and the exciting news is that we're just getting started in this space. We launched it in January, COVID came across in March. So to say the first year was an absolute disaster would be an understatement. Um, but we have now trained well over a thousand swim teachers. We have courses um, every couple of weeks running across the state. We've prided ourselves, as I said, on introducing swim teacher and pool ops and e-learning and all those sorts of things. So if you've got ideas into what would potentially get somebody to choose the LSV license over someone else's, we're very interested in hearing it, okay? There's things that we can do, e-learning, it's a no-brainer, right? You buy some of it off the shelf for 500 bucks and you make it available to 40,000 people in the aquatic industry, okay? We've got the platform, we've got the resourcing. If you guys have got ideas, please let us know and we'll work through them um, as best as possible. That's it for me. So thank you for your time. Um, I'll be here um, for the rest of the day. Should anybody want to have a, have a catch up? Next up, we've got uh, Trudy and Michael. So they're the managers of the diversity and inclusion team for Life Saving Victoria. Um, they've actually assisted in um, initiating quite a few programs across the uh, cold seniors and disability sectors, which is actually inspiring to, to know that those uh, resources are out there. So they're just going to come through and share their their work um, in depth for those who don't know, um, I guess, what they're, they're actually about. So thank you, Trudy and, and Michael. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, a few familiar faces in the room and a few um, that I haven't seen before um, and a few people who have been involved in some of the programs that we're about to talk to you about. So when we talk about our diversity inclusion um, pathways and programs, we're mostly looking at um, three cohorts, that being multicultural, um, people with a disability and older adults. The multicultural communities are the ones that we have um, a quite a big track record of working with over many years um, in providing education programs and then setting them on their pathway to become employable within the aquatics industry. So that, it's swim teachers, it's pool lifeguards, um, it's even instructors with, our, with LSV programs on the beach as well. Um, it's lifesavers at lifesaving clubs. But today we'll talk about the swim teachers and the pool lifeguards. You can see this is an, a case study of um, a young man named Abdullahi. He uh, migrated to Australia from Somalia a number of years ago. Um, lives in the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, we first got onto Abdullahi uh, through another person who we um, trained up to be a lifeguard a couple of years before that. Um, but Abdullahi is one example of um, about 70 to 80 odd people who we would um, mentor and work with and train up each year. Um, and we would find those 80 odd people each year through our classroom programs, our programs on the beach, um, and basically community recruitment. So we, um, we have a number of community organisations that we're constantly in contact with. Um, we see about 13 to 14,000 people in classrooms, and that's language schools, TAFEs, um, you know, youth groups, um, and we would see about 6,000 people on the beach. And we're always having conversations about 
you know, would you like to be a lifeguard one day? Do you like teaching people? Um, can you swim? And if not, this is how we can help you. And if you can already swim, um, because there are plenty of people that, um, that we meet who already have the swimming ability, but they just don't know how to get started and never even thought about um, lifeguarding or swim teaching as a potential career option. Um, so that's where Abdallah, he, he got into the Learn to Swim um, course for about a year or so. And some of these will run with a big community group of 15, 20, 30 people at once. Um, at some pools, we'll sort of have what we call our nursery, um, which is people specifically training up um, for the purpose of becoming pool lifeguards and swim teachers. Um, and yeah, some are just learn to swim courses and we'll promote what we do. And we might find one or two people from these learn to swim courses who are interested. Abdullah, he became a pool lifeguard. And not long after that, with, uh, with five of his mates, started a uh, community youth organisation for young, um, young African boys and girls um, co called Beyond Youth. Um, and through Beyond Youth, recruited over 15 swim teachers and lifesavers uh, in the inner northern suburbs of Melbourne. So that's a photo that was in the Herald Sun in 2019. Um, and these people worked across a number of pools, um, Reservoir, Coburg, Maribyrnong being a few of them. Um, and then the great thing about this was through a bit of funding that we received, we got to work with the Beyond Youth uh, team and they brought about 25 young boys along to Northcote um, Swimming Pool um, and we did a couple of terms of swimming lessons. Um, right now we're running a program out at Ivanhoe for about a dozen, uh, dozen young boys as well and they're kind of going through the training process to become upskilled as lifeguards once they get their swimming to, um, to a certain level. So we're here to mentor people through the whole process. We're here to try and find and identify people to um, come along the journey. And at the end of it, we're only going to, I guess, recommend and put people through the process who think we believe are legitimate candidates that can do the job. Um, because <laughs> otherwise it won't be looking very good on us if we recommend people who we don't think are fit to um, take on these pool lifeguards and, and swimming teacher jobs. A number of reasons, and if you've heard um, myself or someone else from our team talk before, um, we were spoken about the fact that it's a good thing for, the, um, for the, your staff, your workforce to reflect, reflect the diversity of your community. Um, if there's X amount of people who have a disability in your community, that should be reflected in, um, in the staff. I mean, it's um, 101 for any uh, organisation's diversity and inclusion plan. Um, and you know, cold communities is, is no exception. Um, you know, these people make community role models and will bring other people from the community in, make them feel more welcome when they see people in the workforce that um, yeah, basically have a similar background as they do. Reflects the council strategy. Every council now has a big focus on diversity and inclusion. Um, and I know we're all, all swimming pools are tied to, um, to councils in one way or another. And we've found by talking with a number of organisations or a number of swimming pools over the years that things like first aid incidents and behavioural challenges will actually go down um, once they employ staff who are of a similar background or cultural, um, cultural background to the people who attend those pools. Um, so that's sort of an interesting added bonus there. Um, and we've found generational, generational change with employing people um, from cold communities specifically. Um, for example, we trained, um, trained a young girl at the Williamstown Life Saving Club uh, over Christmas time and she only found out about our program because 15 years earlier when we were first starting off um, this whole thing through Life Saving Victoria, we actually trained her mum to be a swim teacher um, out at Aquapulse. And um, now this girl is going to be trained up as a lifeguard and um, if there's anyone from Aquapulse in the room, hopefully get a job at the end of this year. Um, <laughs> so LSV, um, we really do play a big role in mentoring people um, before they get a, um, uh, before they do their training, whilst they're going through their training, um, through the uh, interview and onboarding process um, and once they're employed, like they don't fall off our list. We keep checking in with them, seeing how they're going um, and work with the, with the candidates in the pool to make a really smooth ongoing process. Um, so that's where we can really add value um, 
in mentoring all the people that we we put forward as potential candidates. So that's what we have been doing and will continue to do. I believe we have our first Slido question. Um, okay, and the first question, which will come up on your phone, and this won't um, pop up on the screen or anything, this is just for our information. Um, has your facility been involved in the cold employment pathway? So with this Slido poll, we're not actually sharing the results um, for this one. It's more our understanding. So anything that you do put through, we'll be able to see. As Michael said, I'm uh, Trudy McAuliffe uh, and I'm from the diversity and inclusion team and I'm working on um, a lot of new opportunities for us to bring um, to the industry, mainly focused on people with a disability and also seniors. So in the last 12 months, we have been exploring opportunities to replicate the successful program that we've done with our multicultural communities and looking to see how we can bring more older adults that are interested in um, still being a part of the workforce and bringing them into a great industry which is the aquatics and recreation industry. We know that there's a shortage with our staff that we've spoken all about today and so as part of coming out of COVID, LSV identified an opportunity to offer free training um, to our older adults. We sent one um, equivalent to one email out to our members that are linked in with our life-saving clubs and we had an astronomical response. That then led to um, over 25 people going through the course, that's either swim teacher or being a pool lifeguard, and who are now actually um, already um, on deck uh, in some aspects um, or completing hours. From that one email, 25 doesn't sound a lot, but we only had a limited amount of funding for that program um, and being the first time we explored that as an option. So Harold Holt have got a fantastic new swimming teacher on board. Um, I know uh, Geelong Leisure Facilities have got um, some lifeguards ready to go there. And also I believe uh, Vic Uni have also put on a, um, a fantastic uh, gentleman who is now teaching um, swimming lessons with them. They're just a couple that, um, that I've heard back in the last couple of days because we are mentoring and working with them as well as supporting facilities um, as, as they need. The other thing that we will be um, exploring, and we have had a little bit of a taster working with um, Monash and um, Holmes Glen in supporting them through an IPP project. So this has been setting up um, people with a disability, getting them workforce ready and uh, taking them through a swimming teacher course, a pool lifeguard course, and doing um, placement at a facility which was Monash Aquatic and Recreation Centre. This program has been a massive success and has been replicated from the medical industry. So it's something that has been um, done there in the past with huge success. Um, so there's a couple of um, faces that I know some of the people in the room will actually um, recognise because they have actually been employed already. So um, I saw the other day Bass, who's uh, down at our bottom left, um, he's actually um, gone through the interview process and I believe has uh, is on pool deck at Aquarina Aquatic and Leisure Centre. So well done to the team there. Um, and we also have Jack here uh, who's working at um, both Monash Aquatic and Recreation Centre and across the Geelong Leisure Facilities. I also do know that he's working um, in paid employment with education in the Mentone Life Saving Club. So these are a couple of people that we will be following their journey along um, to see how do we replicate that work and how do we get more people and support more people from different um, backgrounds um, to be workforce ready for you. So a couple of things that I want to draw to your attention here. Um, we heard about the great pathway programs that have been supported um, through the multicultural um, communities in terms of the programs that we go out and deliver. We're now replicating that as well in our seniors and disability communities. So. What a couple of questions we want to ask is, what are you currently doing in actively employing 
multicultural people in your community? What are you doing to actively employ seniors? And what are you doing to actively employ people with a disability? And I want you to have a quick discussion on your table. Actively means that you are currently seeking and engaging those communities, not just sending a blanket job advertisement out. So when we did some results earlier, there was probably nothing that alerted us to this is currently happening without the support of LSV. And we want to know that you are because we see some great results happening, but we will really challenge you to do it yourself. But as a little bit of a parting thought, I want you to have a think who this person here is, um, what he may do. Is he seeking employment? Is he from a multicultural background? Does he have a disability? Is he looking for training and work? Could he be my dad? Could he be your dad? So don't just look at a picture or your potential candidates. Have a think about and ask those questions. You know, could they be your next duty manager, swimming teacher, pool lifeguard? or beyond creating a pathway and a career for this person. So it turns out that is Trudy's dad and she's signed a, him up for all the training courses that we offer. <laughs> Half true. <laughs> um, so the last Slido poll that we have is the question, how can LSV support you? Now, we, uh, we mentioned a few of the ways that we can support you. Um, potentially, and a few of the ways that we have supported centres over the years. Um, but I'm sure we're missing things, and it would be really interesting to know uh, specifically what else we can be doing to help in these areas of recruiting um, diverse staff. Oh, thank you, Trudy and Michael. I'm hoping that, yeah, that gives a little bit of insight on some programs and initiatives that LSV have, and I guess give some train of thought for ourselves personally as the industry and what um, extra avenues we have in regarding for... Um, recruitment and adding value to to our teams. I know personally, um, I hired in my last um, role down at the Peninsula Hot Springs, I did hire um, older adults just for the mentoring aspect for my younger team. Um, and it worked out really well. There's um, life experience that you just can't pay for in that um, in that avenue. So that um, it definitely works. Um, and that's it. it definitely got welcomed by the younger team as well because it gave them a little bit of insight and helped um, their maturity in their, in their role. Um, next up, we have Leah Andrews, who's the swim school manager for the Peninsula Aquatic Recreation Centre down in Frankston. Um, they've initiated a really great program down there for their, for their swim teachers. They've, it's something, an initiative to really um, think outside, think outside the square on, on how we can address the shortage. Um, the discussion I had with Leah was actually, yeah, rather insightful. Um, and I hope that um, it would bring you that same insight that I had with myself. Um, so if Leah, if you'd like to, to come and present the, the fantastic program um, for your team down that way. Um, I thought just before I started, actually, I've got a good story from this morning. We had Sunrise down to do a feature on our STAR program this morning. And there were two older gentlemen who were swimming laps in the back of the camera. So I went up to them and I said, keep swimming, it looks really, really good. And at the end, they asked us what it was all about um, and we were sort of describing the STAR program what I'm going to talk to you about a little bit. And um, they were really keen to get involved and become swim teachers. So just from that little interaction, I think we've got two more possible swim teachers that are going to join us down at Park. And it's just from a small interaction from telling them they had their five minutes of fame. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my name is uh, Leah, so I'm a uh, Park Swim Manager. And we have started something called the STAR Program, which is the Swim Teacher Active Recruitment. So we've looked at recruiting from a different angle. We're trying to look at removing barriers to become swimming teachers and looking at the problems and the issues that we had with um, retention and actually recruitment as well. So basically where it came from, uh, the program, in, back in lockdown, they uh, planned a lot of this program. I came on at Park at a really good time. All of this was done for me and I got to take the program on and actually physically do it. So I had the good part of it. Um, so a lot of that thanks needs to go to three particular people. Last time, two of them were in the room. 
So Julia Wood, some of you might know, Elisa Danger, and Shen Mounsey, which I'm not sure if some of you here might work with Shen. So there were three really, really talented people that put this program together. So I thought I'd start with a really good picture of where we wanted to end. So these are six, there's six there. These are six of our swim teachers that came through our program. They now work on a Saturday morning at Park. They're a really big part of our program now. This is obviously at the start of their shift. They're very excited, they're very warm, <laughs> lots of energy. <laughs> um, so they're a huge part of our program, probably teaching up to 200 students just on our Saturday morning. These guys also work in other um, times as well. So that was a really good, fun photo. That was our aim to our finish and we got there. Okay, so what was the problem? I think we all knew that we had a big swim teacher drought. We were in trouble. We had teachers not come back after our lockdowns and we had at Park uh, over 700 on our wait list. In the end, we had to actually close our wait list. We had that many, we didn't know what we're gonna do with them or where we're gonna go. So we closed our wait list when we were at 700. Our solution was our Swim Teacher Active Recruitment Program. And the difference with our program, I've heard a lot this morning about funding, uh, free courses and things like that. Part of our program was to include that, but also to include earn while you learn. And a big part of our program has been um, being immersed in the culture right from the beginning. So having that connection to Park, having that connection to each other and within the bigger team has proven to be a real success of the program. Okay, so a few key features of the program. We're gonna go through the program briefly, but I really wanna talk about why we think the program is successful um, and why we've recruited, how many we have recruited and the retention of that. So very basically the program, um, earn while you learn. So all of the qualifications are paid for, no upfront costs at all. So we help them with off swim course, we pay for all of that. We help them go out and book their CPR course book their, uh, organise their working with children check. So we do it all with them. Um, they are immersed, as I said, in that team culture right from the beginning because we do do it with them. We have mentors and guides along the way. So it was really good to hear that this morning. Some of the importance was about the mentors and that's what we've built into this program. Um, and they've got guaranteed employment at the end of the program. We do have a marketing team that goes behind and they do all of the... Uh, all of our comms that go out, they do the uh, logos and things like that. So we did actually go out with our program quite locally. Um, we went out, uh, our Facebook page, our website, word of mouth was a really big one at the time. Uh, simple things like screens at our centre didn't cost us anything. Uh, I think we got probably oh, at least five right at the very last minute of one of our programs that said, oh yeah, I saw it last night on the screen when I came down. Um, so it's the small things. Okay, very quickly, the, uh, the star applicants knew the journey right from the start. They knew it was going to happen from when they began the program right through to when they finished and we would become qualified teachers. So we had a bit of a journey laid out for them. So the star candidates would put in an expression of interest. Uh, they'd come along to an information session. From those two, we actually chose our candidates for our program. So program one, we had over 60 applicants and we chose only 11. 11 we thought was a good number to bring through together. Uh, we chose them for why they wanted to become swim teachers. That was an important one to us. What their availability was like, we needed them working. Um, sort of what background, what history they had. Were they swimmers themselves? Have they never thought of teaching swimming before? We've got quite a few of those that have come on board that had never thought of actually teaching swimming. Um, one of our really successful girls, Kaylee, she came from working at KSC, um, and my ops manager over here is gonna hear this for the first time this morning. Had a chat with her the other day, um, and she's loving working. She wants to work more. She's a little bit worried, we touched on that, um, you know, the time that they can't work. She's, she's already worried about summer and six weeks where she's got no work. So she's thinking of becoming a lifeguard as well. We'll see, Jera. <laughs> we might try and hold on to her a little bit more. Um, so there's some, but then I thought there was a really good connection between maybe there's a gap in the work that she could do, but she's already looking ahead as to what other options there are in our centre. Um, so I'm happy to share her. Uh, so they do go through. So when, when the candidates start on board, we onboard them all, uh, they get into the pool and they start doing their teaching hours right from the word go. 
they've paid for these teaching hours. Um, so it's sort of like that onboarding, what we are talking about before, that onboarding and paying them right from the start. Uh, they, they do come in as a level one and they do their hours. They then go, go away and do their OSWIM course, LSV course, um, and then once they're assessed, once they're ready to go, they move up to a level two. Once all of their licences and everything comes back, they're then onboarded as a park swim teacher. So it's a pretty straightforward journey that they can, and they can see that where they're progressing and where they can step up. We have run two programs. So we've done a pilot and then we quickly turned that around and, and went again with another program because it was so successful. So we streamlined the second program a little bit more and we had our swim teachers all trained up and ready to go within two months. It was a push, it is hard to do, uh, but we had it very stepped out. This is what we gave to them day one um, of what they needed to do. This time we had over about 40 candidates and this time we chose 12. Okay, so again, we we're very specific about what we wanted to choose um, and the types of people that we thought would be a good fit in our organisation. Um, the culture fit and that team fit is a really important one um, and it has showed us we haven't made probably 100% correct decisions. Um, we have had two candidates who have dropped out and I think that was really that culture fit and they just weren't too sure. By getting in the water right at the start as well, doing those shadows, they got to know what the role was all about. So from that, from that actual process, we did have that one person pull out. So maybe they weren't ready for that in water. So they got to know right from the start. We hadn't sort of gone through and spent all of that money and done all of that on them. So it was a really good, good timing for them, good timing for us. Basically down the end, so we worked, we worked backwards with this one. We wanted them into our program by term two. So we wanted them all ready to go at the end, the start of April. So they were, they were ready and they were all rostered on for at least two shifts a week. We do have a strong schools program as well that runs every day. Um, so many of our staff candidates actually work nearly five days a week teaching our school kids too. So there's sort of options and ways that they can move around. Uh, we did want to know from them what they valued from the program. Um, so we did survey them. We came up with some really good quotes um, from many of our stars. It actually shows that they've come from different uh, aspects. So Molly M, the first one over here, is a high school student. Um, she was very excited, you know, sort of young, very excited um, and getting a job at Park at the end and being able to be then a member at Park as well and use the facilities was a big one for her. Uh, Kevin, who is the middle one? Kevin uh, has spent 30 years in the postal service. So he wasn't quite ready to retire, kind of had enough of what he was doing and he actually wanted to give back because he knew how important swimming was. So this is his way of, of giving back. He's a real character. Kevin is really fun to have on board. Um, it's really good to have those type of people with us. Um, Kaylee J, sort of looking at that, um, I suppose that age group, I don't think she's quite at that sort of 40s age group though, but she is a mum with a young child, wanting to get back into the workforce. Um, she's a really community-minded lady. She knows how important for her own child it is to swim. Um, so she's really keen to, to get in. And the actual uh, pay right from the start really helped her be able to start that role and not have to have that out, out cost when she couldn't then put her child in daycare as well. So it really balanced it for her, made it possible. Um, Beth, about two weeks into the program with Beth, she appeared on the front page of our local newspaper as our youth citizen of the year. So we knew we'd chosen a good one for, with her. Um, and she's really loved that team. She's, met, she's a very friendly, bubbly, outgoing girl. Met lots of friends um, and she's really part of the team now. Uh, and then we had Mari down the bottom where she just loves swimming. She just wanted to do more swimming, she just loves swimming. So lots of diverse backgrounds as to why they love the program. So a few of our learnings that we thought were really important um, as to why our program has been successful and a program like this I guess can be used in any areas of our industry and just change a little bit to your particular um, roles. So the timing of the program was really important. So keeping that continuity and not having a break. Our pilot program we put on when we we're coming out of COVID, coming out of our restrictions and our lockdown, it was a little bit hit and miss. Uh, our second program, we really tightened that up and they were with us from the time that they got into the water. We, because they were onboarded as employees right from the start, 
they were able to come to our uh, events. I think we had an 80s night or a 60s night, I can't remember. Um, we had a movie night for uh, Peninsula Leisure. We put on a pink patrol, they came along to that. So they were invited to all of those extra things that if they were just coming in as um, someone doing their shadow hours, they wouldn't have been involved in. So it was a really important way to bring them, bring them in. Um, the swim teacher course in our second program, we actually organised that swim teacher course that all of them to, could go along to together. So they started building that bond right from the start. So that was really important to them. They actually did that. We were lucky enough to get a course at our centre as well. So they got to know people around the centre. But that bond between them, so those 12 people that bonded together, has been really important. It still shows. Um, the sense of team and community, that's, that's one of the biggest ones. Just that they've, from the very start, they've been together. Um, and, and the importance of actually earning that initial money as well. Uh, uh, so one of the things that sort of come back to us as well is to make sure that we're developing our best new teachers. That we want to develop our existing teachers and how to perhaps mentor them a little bit better and actually give them some more guidance. So our sort of next set of work is going to our existing teachers and how to build them up um, and help with our program with our new stars, which we are starting our next star round next week. So we're pretty excited. It's all coming back. So our results uh, from our star program, we've got 23 out of 26 that are with us. So three people have uh, moved on. Um, so they're between them, excluding schools, where a lot of them do the five days uh, school. They're doing 38 shifts between them. So it's 228 classes. That's over 1,000 kids um, they're teaching swimming to that didn't have that chance. We did have, as I said, we did have a waiting list of over 700. 500 of those were automatically offered spaces once we had everybody on board. And we're just now, day by day, we're just adding more people or, or more members into our program. Uh, so, and the invaluable uh, centre and mentoring has been a really, really big one. So the, the basic finances, if you add up the cost of the course and the cost of that training, it's approximately $1,000 per star to do it. But the return from that, if we had a star teaching two sessions a week, so approximately about seven hours of teaching, we would uh, completely cover those costs in two weeks. So that return for the investment is pretty quick, pretty fast, um, and we think well worth it. And this photo is a celebration. We took our stars out, we had a celebration. Actually, we took the whole team out. We had a celebration. Um, I should have bought one of those towels. So we actually organised towels and we put the logo on it for them and that was their graduation gift for graduating our program. Our other swim teachers also got a towel with the park logo. So we made sure everyone was welcome. Um, so thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, awesome, thank you, Leah. So again, that's one of the, the initiatives that's actually out there um, in the leisure centres, again, um, as Lee mentioned, it was a bit of a trial and error. There's not um, a perfect, um, you know, solution to everything, but they've taken the errors and learned how to improve the program. And this is where networking itself is really important. So we've got something that um, that is valuable and works within the industry and that um, Leah is actually happy to go through um, and share, which if it's something that works with industry, that's what we should be and involving each other to do. There's a lot of centers out there that actually have wonderful initiatives, um, which should be shared to help us as a whole. We all have, as an industry, the same one massive goal, which again, for the swim teacher industry is to know that every child in Australia learns how to swim. But as lifeguards or as um, aquatic centers, we wanna reach that zero person drowning. And that's collective as a whole as an industry. So we can learn to have that networking and if we know that we're trying in our, our, our initiatives and they're working, why not share it? Yeah. And then if we've got retention or recruitment strategies that are working within ourselves, again, share that around. The problem is industry-wide. It's not just your own personal centre. So if we can, and this is why this whole um, industry being face-to-face -face in the room will just help us along the way. So the next um, presenter that we have um, is uh, Angela Olander, who's actually graciously um, provided her time today. With, uh, we'll learn on how we can actually communicate effectively with our teams. And as we know, communication can actually make or break uh, where we are as a centre to either keep our staff or where we are in actually communicating with our recruitment process. People want to know the details. They want to know the why. 
So what we're going to come through today is actually coming through with a HR um, specialist who's been um, in human resources for over 20 years. So I feel like her um, input would actually be very valuable to us today. So Angela, thank you for your time. Um, look, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Christopher and Life Saving Victoria. Adaptable and effective communication is, is uh, as Christopher mentioned, is key in keeping your employees engaged. And as a leader, you've got an important part to play in that. The part you play is not only identifying the communication styles and effectively communicating with those you lead, but also being aware of your own communication styles and how you work uh, to, uh, or how you come across to those uh, team members. So for this very short session outline, um, we're going to be looking at why adaptable and effective communication is important, um, understanding different styles of communication, how to navigate communication with those different styles, and tips and tricks for you to take away, okay? Things that you can implement straight away in your, in your workplaces and hopefully see more smiles around. So adaptable and effective communication is important because really... We're going to have higher job satisfaction. Retention will increase. People stay if they like being there. What we know, uh, workplaces are melting pots for communication issues. And often people leave managers. They don't tend to leave organisations. Uh, and when communication issues arise, we find that there is increased conflict, there's increased misunderstanding and in turn increased turnover. So... It is important because we want to have healthy workplace cultures that aren't just underpinned by um, having people go to workplace functions, but also in the connections that you as leaders have with those that you lead. As you can see, we can solve conflict pretty easily when we're all on the same page, so to speak. Um, better understanding of each other non-threatening environments, increased self-esteem, people will be feeling that they can share and express their views. Uh, you may find that people want to uh, openly share areas for improvement um, and where things are going well and gives your business an opportunity to prosper and grow. Um, we've talked about uh, higher employee job satisfaction. Um, with uh, that better engagement, you will find that there'll be more business success for you. If you're not worried or too busy having to backfill the staff that you're losing, um, you're going to have more time focusing on the business that you're running or the organisation that you're running. These are some common styles of communication. They, there are some methods out there. You may have all heard of the Myers-Briggs or um, the DISC profiling. This is a bit of a simplified version of that. Um, in, in a nutshell, we've got uh, intuitive communicators, they tend to be unemotional people uh, in, the, in their style of language that's used um, and they don't tend to have much structure so they're quite free-formed in how they're communicating. They want bottom line details uh, and they don't like their time being wasted. Can we think of anyone that we've worked with before that just say, get to the point? Can you just get to the point? What's, I don't want the fluff around it, just tell me what it's about. They tend to be quite direct. Um, analytical communicators are uh, unemotional and linear as well. They like to know process. They like to know steps, but they want to know data. All right, how many people are affected here? When do, what time do I have to be there? Um, what do you need me to do? Okay, they want to know the hard facts and numbers around that. You'll, you'll hear that in, in the words that they use. I've seen a few heads nod. Functional communicators, they're emotional and linear. Okay, so they really care about what's happening, but they want the process. They want to know your A to Z, all right? So when they're coming and talking to you or you're expressing um, a, a directive or, or a job for them to go and do, um, they want to know what's the first step, the second step, the third step, the fourth step, the th fifth step, okay? They want to know the process. Personal communicators, um, they're emotional people. Think emotion. Think they want to establish deep connections with those that they work with. They care about their colleagues. They care about their uh, customers. They use emotive and inclusive language. Oh, so how do you feel about that? 
oh, I feel a bit upset. I, f- I feel a bit upset. My colleagues seems a bit sad about that or I'm feeling really happy about that. So they'll use those, those terms, happy, sad, concerned, worried. Um, they like informal, friendly and warm conversations. So th- they'll be best communicated in that warm, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, good, thanks. Yeah, look, um, I need you to, you know, can you go out and, you know, set up the pool for the day, so to speak. And they're curious of others and the effect that it has on themselves. So when you're introducing workplace change particularly, uh, you're probably going to find um, these people are going to be the most saddest or affected by it. So you, you'll need to be looking at how you're communicating that but also think about how you're going to communicate the effect of others because emotional communicators will be uh, or personal communicators will be concerned about that. So effectively, intuitive communicators, you've got to think big picture, all right? They think in the big picture. Analytical communicators, they like data, okay? Functional communicators, they want process. And personal communicators think emotions. So a real key to navigating different communication styles is understand your style of communication first, all right? Hands up who thinks they're an intuitive communicator in the room. Yep. So you tend to ask questions like, uh, where does this get us? <laughs> What's the bottom line? Can we skip to the end? Hands up who thinks they're an anal- analytical communicator. I want data. I want to know the facts. Yeah, I can't make a decision until I know detail. Yep. <laughs> Functional communicators, what's the process? Or you'll give, you know, you tend to be given a task to do and you're sitting down, you're like, okay, how am I going to do this? Step A, B, C, D. Any, any of those? Yeah. Kind of like planners, yeah? Um, and personal communicators. I'm a HR person, so I'm kind of that. <laughs> All right, so understanding your style of communications is key because when you understand your style of communication, you're going to find that there'll be people that you'll get along at well with straight away. And they'll tend to be the people who have similar communication uh, styles to yours. You'll find that there'll be conflict with people who uh, have different styles of communication to yours, okay? That they're the people you need to be consciously aware of, all right? Only you can change your behaviour because you can't expect someone else to do it. You don't have control over that person's style of communication, their personal history, where they're coming from. Only you have the chance to adapt. As leaders, we're, we're, we're pretty much charged with that responsibility, all right? We need to keep our, our workforce engaged and, uh, and working towards the common goal, okay? We don't want them leaving because they don't like you, okay? Like I said before, people leave managers, they don't tend to leave workplaces or companies. So once we've established your style of communication, we need then to understand the style of the employee, all right? And then you need to adapt your style of communication to, the, to be like that employee's, okay? And then we find we have communication is more effective and you've adapted to it, so you're gonna be getting your messages across more clearly. Okay, so there's some clues that you can rely on when coming up with that. All right, some tips and tricks. What you can adopt here is when speaking with an intuitive communicator, have your recommendations up front. Use clear language, bottom line, big picture. All right, go go straight to the point. Let them ask the questions for the detail. Their attention comes from not wasting their time, right? Um, Analytical communicators, just sharp, short, straight to the point, okay? Um, Have lots of supporting evidence on hand. They want to see that you've got some technical competence, all right? That's, That's how you get their attention, all right? You've got your balance sheet, you've got your stats, all of that. Functional communicators, if I hadn't said it before, I'm going to say it three times. Process, process, process. They're highly detailed. They want to know the proceeding step-by-step expectations of them, okay? So have you ever given someone an instruction and they've come back to you and they've gone, they've walked away and come back and said, sorry, what was it again? I don't, I don't know what you want me to do. <laughs> and then you find yourself, you know, 
taking them through the steps on how to do it. Oh, got it. Okay, off they go. Right? They're probably a um, functional communicator. So that would be an indicator to you to go, ah, that's how that one, that, that employee likes to be communicated with. So I'll know next time I'm speaking with them and giving them an instruction, probably going to talk with them about how they go, ask them how they're going to do it and work with them the steps involved in doing that. Personal communicators tend to be quite collaborative. They want to get involved. They're informal and friendly. There's going to be feelings talked about. <laughs> Are others doing it? Am I the only one doing it? Anyone else? And they get attention from interpersonal warmth. All right, a smile, a how are you, how are you going kind of thing. A bit of empathy, right? Oh, I know, it's a big day today. Well, do you have a nice holiday? Welcome back, we've missed you. Okay? Oh, great, they care about me, they're thinking. Yeah? Spend some time thinking about your employee's style of communication, okay? If you're leading a large team, talk with your team leaders about this and ask them to think about the kinds of styles of communication of those that they team lead in their team, okay? And you can give them some tips and tricks, as we have up here, okay, around how they can communicate. But the key message I want everyone to walk away with today is that understand your style, understand that that can have conflict with people who have other communication styles and that it's up to you to adapt your style of communication so that you can get your clear messages across. We have happier workplaces, people feel more engaged and they'll tend to stick around a bit more. I'm like, oh, yeah, my manager's great. Uh, guiding tips and tricks in general uh, when communicating in the workplace, face-to-face -face is always best. Watch your body language and tone, okay? Before going uh, and, ad and addressing an employee, think about, okay, am I, am I at a level state of mind here? Have I, am I upset about something? Am I bringing anything to this piece that is going to affect my body language or my tone, Okay. Um, sometimes people will listen to tone before they actually listen to what you're talking about, okay, and they'll switch off. Probably emotional, commun personal communicators might do that. Oh, sounds angry. Um, stick to the facts, please. No stories, okay? We do not want assumptions. We don't want judgments. We just want facts, when we're, especially when we're giving feedback to people. We want it to be facts, okay? Um, a good example of giving feedback that um, is fact-based um, is an example here. Yesterday, I noticed that you weren't speaking in our meeting when we were talking about that important project. A judgmental feedback piece would be, oh, you, you seemed uninterested in our meeting yesterday when we were talking about that project piece. Okay, so those two words there, seemed, uninterested. What do you think that person's going to take away from that? I'm not, un I'm not uninterested. I wasn't. So the better option is to stick to what you observed. Okay, I noticed you, you weren't speaking in that meeting. Okay. Ask for their view on what you have said. What are your thoughts on that? It's a very simple question. How can we make this better? How can we work together to get a better outcome? All right. It does, need, it does mean that you're giving them time. They need your time, okay? I know you're all busy people. You've got a lot on your plate. You're all under-resourced uh, and it's much easier to just say, yep, okay, I'll do it or yep, okay, I'll get onto it, all right? Um, but that's just going to perpetuate the problem. People are like, they don't care about me. My boss doesn't give me any time, all right? Well... That's it from me. Yeah. Oh, right at the end? Right at the end. Thank you. Easy. Thank you, Angela. Um, so that in itself, all right, just to even just understand your own interpersonal connection, your own communication style actually really opens up the avenue to your team. Um, that's been me personally, my time in leadership style there. All right, actually getting to know how my team communicates is how I adapt 
and get into that. Not everyone is going to be totally responsive to, you know, to that criticism or positive thing. You've got to kind of have that address to be like, okay, how can I bring the message across to you? Not everyone communicates the same. And this is all trial and error, like especially from my own personal experiences. So communication in everything we do um, is crucial. So everything that we've um, gone through and presented out today, um, it's not about for us to provide you the answers. We just want you to question things. We want you to be reflective on where we are, where yourselves are at in your own operations and ask questions, okay, how can we solve it? Right, it's not about for us to be, we've got their solutions out there, but we're not going to go out and just go through and, hey, here's the answers, here's what you should be doing, here's how we make that impact. Right, the whole point for this one here is for us as an industry to work through the problems that are identified, but work together as an industry to find those solutions. And this is, again, like I'll go through and reiterate, the, the importance of networking, and that's what we do. This is what we share. We're in this together. All right, if you've got a fantastic solution, we'll find a way to share it. If you've got something you want to bring out to industry, well, this is where LSV is your resource to come out and be able to, to share that, much like um, Leah with a program at Park. If there's something out there that wants to be shared, please fill out the resource uh, to reach out to us to be able to help us facilitate um, that to, to others here. Yeah, so what I'll do just really quickly is just um, I, I will throw back to each of our um, presenters or each of our, our guest presenters a single question. First up, um, Michael, biggest takeaway I had away from, from your sp um, speech is that people are leaving the industry um, with their managers unattuned or uh, unaware of what their needs are. Um, and I was just wondering for us managers in the room, what do you think the best things are that we can do to understand our employees' needs? And I'll throw this to you. I think it's just sort of repeating what we've just said, Dan. It's just one-on-one, -on -one, just getting to know your staff. Um, if, you're not, if you don't get to know who your staff is, you're not going to know what they're about, where they've come from, what they want to do, what their life ambitions are, what's next for them. Um, and I suppose the more you can engage with that, get to know what they're about and even just perceive or look like you're helping them out, achieving those long-term goals, um, they're going to stay on, they're going to kick around because they feel valued, they feel appreciated. Thanks, Michael, and very well summed up. Leah, I'm going to um, throw to yourself next. Where can facilities find out more about the STAR program um, and how do managers go about starting their own? And I, I assume you don't want to be flooded with, with phone calls. So, yeah. um, As I said before, we're actually starting our third round, so you can go onto our website and have a bit of a look and find out some information. Um, I think it ties in quite nicely with that funding that the industry's got as well. If you can jump onto that funding, not using your own, that's sort of our next little look at, um, is a good way to go as well. But feel free to contact me at Park. I don't mind the questions and sharing our success because we want everybody back in the water swimming. Thank you. Um, and Angela, thank you for your presentation. It's very insightful. Um, biggest things I'm taking away from, from your, um, your piece there is, is be face-to-face um, -face as a manager um, and um, have a level state of mind. And I know that from being a very scary manager of some people in the room in the past, um, sometimes because I'm a very direct speaker, um, I can come across as very intimidating to, to my team. Um, the question, um, I guess, what's the easiest um, way to sort of break the ice with employees? I think with a new employee, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you just let them know that you're really glad to have them on board, uh, that you look forward to working with them and... Uh, embarking on the journey that they're going to have with with you and the centre and um, really ask them about how can I make you and support you in your success here and that will get them speaking and talking and feeling valued at the outset. If everybody in the room could please um, join me in um, giving a round of applause to all of our speakers today. Thank you very much.